Um, especially again, acknowledging that Department of Health is under a lot of uh, pressure these days to do a lot of work. We want to get started promptly. So the, the reason for today's invitation was um, driven first and foremost by the discovery of PCBs at Burlington High School at such a level that they've had to move out and find uh, alternate headquarters, whatever, for the foreseeable future. So we wanted to check in uh, and learn more about not just the Burlington High School question, but also um, how the uh, what the levels are, how you judge the toxicity of PCBs and how a state standard functions compared to a federal standard. Um, usually people are saying, well, they appreciate that Vermont's standard being more general, I think in some cases more strict. I'm thinking of PFAS, for instance, um, that we're more protective than the federal standards of, of the health of Vermonters. And that's a good thing. Uh, someone did come back to me going the opposite direction and say, well, if we increase the Vermont's levels to match the federal levels, would uh, Burlington High School then be judged safe? And that would be the direction we would go. So uh, I'm not sure that's our, we're not here to make any choices or recommendations this morning, but just to know why there's a difference and if what the state's thinking is um, why we have a difference and what, uh, where we might go next. So I see, I see uh, Ms. Vose, Mr. Englander, Ms. Capolino. Um, I, I don't know if uh, we should call on you in order on our agenda, that would be Ms. Vose first, or if someone, you know, the, you're all three here, we we're asking you to, you know, this could be like tag team wrestling. You can move back and forth between yourselves uh, uh, in order to work on the questions at hand. So why don't we start with just an explanation of PCBs as a toxin briefly and, and what, uh, and why there's uh, two standards in play and how that relates to the Burlington High School scene. And then just to add a little more, and, and how is Burlington High School representative of high schools or other public buildings generally from that uh, era? Some people worry that BHS might be kind of the canary in the mine shaft telling us about other schools of that vintage. Yeah, um, this is Sarah. And if it's okay with everyone, we would like um, Trish to go first because she's got a PowerPoint that'll give you um, some of that information. And then I'm happy to um, answer questions and discuss more after that. Great, thanks so much. So just give me a minute to get the PowerPoint up. I'm Trish, by the way. Good morning, thanks for coming in. Mm -hmm. Sure. Are you seeing that? Uh, not yet. No. <laughs> okay, hold on one second. Sorry. So, Senator Bray, maybe uh, Jude yes, could put it up. You think Jude could put that up for her? Give me one second. I'm trying one more time. Okay. This should work. Ah, there it is. There we are. So I wanted to go over just a little of, you know, what PCBs are. So polychlorinated biphenyls, um, they are human made chemicals. They uh, were used commonly in buildings and electrical equipment. EPA banned them in 1979. Um, PCBs are harmful to the immune system, reproductive, nervous, and endocrine systems. Um, they, you know, can cause impaired immune, immunologic development, fertility problems, changes to brain development in utero, thyroid hormone changes, increases in type 2 diabetes, and they are cancer-causing. So they're not good chemicals um, for the environment or uh, people. And um, Sarah, Dr. Vos can go over a lot more of how these played into the values we're looking at. 
specific to PCBs and building materials because that's what we're talking about. Um, they are <clears throat> they were used um, to impart flexibility basically to keep um, products soft so they wouldn't get hard and dry up. Um, where we find them mostly in buildings um, and specific, specifically in schools, in the caulking, in the paint, fluorescent light ballasts and the capacitors that are in those light ballasts, window glazing, ceiling tiles, spray on fireproofing, floor finish and mastics such as the glue or resin. So there isn't, I would say one thing that um, PCBs are not found in for the most part in older buildings. Um, <clears throat> why is this a concern? So why do these PCBs in building materials impact us? So our biggest concern uh, with schools is the impact to indoor air. Um, they can be released into the air through off-gassing. So if you have caulking that has PCBs in it and it's um, in the building, PCBs can off-gas like a vapor into the air for it to be um, inhaled and breathed. Um, PCBs can be absorbed into the building materials that are surrounding. I'm going to use caulk a lot um, <clears throat> that are next to the caulking. So the masonry next to the caulking can become impregnated with PCBs. And now the building material itself is now contaminated with PCBs. Um, furnishings inside the buildings have this great foam inside them that um, absorb PCBs and they can become a long-term sink and continue to off-gas and provide PCBs to the air. And then dust itself can settle onto the contaminated building material, become contaminated and then become airborne and spread throughout a building. Um, and then going on to the last bullet is that some of the PCBs present in some of the, of the products can contaminate the adjoining materials um, and contaminate them. They can fall out of the building and contaminate the ground surface outside the building also. Um, the health department and, and agency of natural resources and the agency of education worked on a potential process that we think would work when looking at the potential for PCBs in schools. Um, our thought process was looking at any school that was constructed or renovated before 1980 and renovated because you could have used any of the PCB containing products to renovate such as the caulking or the paints or the mastic. If a school um, was not constructed or renovated before 1980, we didn't think testing was necessary. We also wanted to make sure that all of the old fluorescent light ballasts and capacitors were replaced. I understand that Vermont went through a pretty large process of, of getting all of these out of school. So that's already you know, good for us. Um, but sometimes some of the capacitors may have leaked. So we'd want to see if there's any, any oil leaking or the capacitor itself was not removed when the light ballast was removed. Um, and then we would look to see what sources of PCBs could exist in the school. We came up with a checklist that um, identifies most of the products that I listed earlier and others that could be in the school um, to use that and determining where potential sources of PCBs could be in the school. And then the next step would be testing the indoor air for PCBs. Um, and we put together a guidance document that goes through what the testing look like, looks like the um, analytical methods and reporting requirements. Um, when uh, results come that, back in. Determining where potential sources of PCBs could be. Um, when the results come back in, we'd work with the Department of Health to evaluate what the concentrations were and any next steps that were needed. And then we would work with the schools to determine um, where the sources might be and how to best remove or mitigate those exposures. Um, the question is, you know, what does that look like if you do um, detect PCBs in indoor air? What do you do next? So we'd go back to making sure that all of the fluorescent light ballasts were removed, that there wasn't any staining inside the building. Um, if school's in session, we'd look at trying to implement some best management practices. So ventilation, wet cleaning to clean surfaces and duct work to make sure we're getting any contaminated dust out of the school. 
um, collaboration with health, uh, working on how to um, address any detected concentrations, the risk and the next steps, sampling to identify PCB sources in the school, um, looking at how to remove any of those sources um, and then mitigate if you can't remove them. And then resampling to ensure that we've done the best that we can. These are the current screening values that exist. Um, for the most part, just to take a step back, PCBs are regulated by EPA. Um, most PCBs, actually all PCBs and building materials are regulated by EPA um, and the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources for the most part regulates PCBs in soil, groundwater, surface water sediments, not in building materials. Um, this is a way for us to ensure that um, PCBs that are in building materials and impacting indoor air are being um, taken care of and we're being protective of um, the people that work in the schools, students and teachers. Um, so the Department of Health calculated a screening value that's 15 nanograms per cubic meter that we look at as um, the detection that if you're below that, you don't need to do additional work. And if you're above it, we need to evaluate further. EPA has several different values that they have to evaluate um, impacts to indoor air in schools. And they're listed below in this table and they're based on age of um, the school population. I wanna be clear though, that um, EPA is basically saying that these are not to be interpreted as bright line or not to exceed values. And that EPA is recommending that concentrations of PCBs in indoor air be kept as low as reasonably achievable. So even if you achieve one of those values, it doesn't mean that your um, school is okay. You still have additional work to do under EPA authority. Um, in 2013, um, the Agency of Natural Resources, Department of Health and um, Agency of Education, I think at that time it might've been the Department of Education, we were working towards trying to evaluate um, potential PCB impacts to our schools in Vermont. And so we, we looked at four different schools in the state that met the criteria I listed before, built or renovated before 1980. So um, we did Berrytown, Champlain Elementary, Holland Elementary, and um, Mount Anthony. And so for Berrytown, the takeaway here was that we collected 23 indoor air samples in the school. Three of the samples had detections. Um, they're listed there, 3356 and 130 nanograms per cubic meter. After evaluation by the Department of Health, it's determined that the levels are not a significant health threat because the average indoor air concentrations were below 15 nanograms per cubic meter and we didn't require any additional work. Champlain Elementary is in the same situation. Um, we collected 20 indoor air samples there. Um, four of those had detections. They're listed out 27, 32, 36, and 65. And it was the same analysis and outcome for Champlain Elementary. The other two schools were Holland and Mount Anthony. Um, Holland had 10 samples. Mount Anthony at 24, they all came back non-detect less than 15 nanograms per cubic meter. So we were feeling okay, I guess, about our outcome <laughs> with the schools. Um, but here's Burlington High School um, and what, what we're finding in Burlington High School. So I only listed four of the buildings. We did sample six of the buildings that were there. Um, and I'm listing them out as buildings because they are um, separate buildings that are just connected by walkways. Um, so building A, um, we've done up to 12 indoor air samples. Concentrations ranged from four, so it's still below the 15, to up to 260 nanograms per cubic meter. Um, building B, um, 12 samples range from 27 to 270, so all 12 were um, contaminated. Building D, same thing, um, 10 indoor air samples, and they range between 11 and 300 nanograms per cubic meter and building F um, ranged from, I actually can't see, this is 160, I think, 160 to 7,100 nanograms per cubic meter. Um, building F was the, the um, building that we got the results back first, um, which um, caused the school to consider 
relocating with students. Um, so for each building, what we're doing with Burlington High School, it sounds like you wanted to have a little background on the work that we're doing there. Um, the school's consultant has gone through and they've done a very comprehensive um, survey of all the potential PCB um, containing products within the school. Um, they are collecting a lot of data so that we can understand what products might be causing the largest impacts to the indoor air so that they can be removed as part of their renovation or mitigated if they can't be removed. Um, we are starting to get results back from building A. And based on what my understanding is right now that the caulking and the floor mastic have some of the higher concentrations in building A. Um, they are working methodically through each building to try and collect building material samples so they can have a better understanding of how to best um, renovate, remediate, and mitigate the school for future use. Um, the budget considerations that went into the requests or went into the governor's budget that you're looking at um, was based on our estimate of the fact that there might be up to 300 schools statewide that um, meet the basically built or renovated before 1980. Um, we're looking at, you know, a range of costs um, to sample each school, which would be between $15,000 and $20,000 per school to collect indoor air samples. And the remaining funds would be used to provide a publicly accessible data management system and provide technical assistance from both Agency of Natural Resources and the Department of Health. What was not considered in the budget <laughs> um, is, is if indoor air um, concentrations are found to be elevated, there is no cost within that budget to, to do any of the sampling. I was just talking about that's happening at the Burlington High School to look for those sources within the, the school. Um, there is no cost in the budget to remediate or mitigate an impacted school. Um, and the costs that I've listed here are um, ranging between small school where you're maybe you're just taking out some caulking to large complex schools where there are a lot of different um, building material contaminant issues. None of these costs include um, replacement costs. So if there's glazing on a window, it doesn't include the cost to replace the window. It doesn't include the cost to put new tile down if you're taking out the mastic. And it doesn't include the cost to um, put new caulking or anything like that into a building. Can we pause here just for a moment? Uh, one is uh, the prior slide um, are the tasks here, the statewide survey, for instance, are they're already in the budget and you already have a, a plan to go ahead and do this work? Is that uh, on your to-do list already? Or this is an idea that maybe it would be a good idea to do it? The, the cost is on our to-do list. So we have not done any survey or inventory of the schools yet to date um, to determine how many fit within the built or renovated before 1980 category. Okay, and so uh, do you have a, a approximate timeline for when you would start this statewide survey and how long it would take to conduct it? Um, we're waiting for data from the Agency of Education on schools in the state so that we could actually reach out to those schools. I would estimate once we get that information, um, we could start doing um, outreach and receive data back within six months would be my guess to have a very comprehensive understanding of what the population is. Okay, great. Um, and let me pause just to look around the rooms here and see if there are any other, if any other members of the two committees have questions. Uh, Senator Hooker. Thank you. Um, thank you, Patricia. And I, I'm just curious to know on the buildings that you tested in Burlington High School, three of them seem to be, you know, pretty close in the numbers, but F, building F is a real outlier. Um, what was that building? <laughs> building F is the building that has their tech center in it and their daycare. Um, <laughs> building A has their gym. So they all have different, different building uses and different construction inside them. Some of them are all classrooms, some of them may be more industrial. Um, but each one will find out, I think, more about what the main source 
of the contaminant issues that are as we continue to sample. Sure. Um, Senator Lyons, then Senator Campion. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the for the slideshow and presentations. Very helpful. Uh, so I have a couple of questions, and um, first relating to EPA, but then uh, moving down into the questions around our local high schools. So when was the last time that the EPA evaluated and made changes to the standards for PCBs? Do you know? So I know at least for, um, for soil um, and building materials is 1980 timeframe um, when the Tosca regulations came out. I'm pretty sure Dr. Vos 1976, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know um, Dr. Vos will be able to talk to you about when they did the evaluation for the indoor air values, which is more recent. Um, I don't know that. that okay. Part. And then, and then another question related, I mean, because obviously the, the uh, understanding of the effect of lower levels has changed significantly uh, since that time. Um, the, uh, the next question I have is with respect to um, enforcement, consumer products enforcement, attorney general's office and uh, through the attorney general's office and has, was that active I don't re I don't remember when that came into play. Was that active after 1980? Uh, this you don't ha if you don't know the answer, we can probably we can find out. But certainly, there may be some leakage in the consumer products that came into the state if there wasn't any oversight uh, for that. So I don't know. Um, I don't. Okay. Um, then. So that and then the the testing that's gone on obviously since 2013, have you done any testing at all on buildings that were constructed after 1980? And then as you're looking at Burlington High School, um, that seems like such a high level in that one building. It suggests to me that there might've been some additions, uh, additive PCBs since 1980 and are you getting at, are you able to inquire about that and get at that issue? Um, oh, oh, sorry. Yep, go ahead. Okay, so to be clear, um, within Vermont, state Vermont um, government, there is no one that regulates PCBs and building materials. So we don't usually get involved in this process. Um, the the times that we are normally involved where there are PCBs and building materials is, is through our brownfields renovations for the most part where we're seeing it and we're looking for it there and they're, they're cleaning it up. But at the same time, usually EPA will be involved. And so there's already a regulatory authority there. So there's not been a lot of reporting to the state on when PCBs are being found in schools. Um, I am aware through recent um, digging that there has been um, some PCBs that are being found during renovations in schools, but indoor air is not being tested as part of that um, removal of usually caulking or window glazing. Um, to the Burlington High School question, um, our understanding is that most of the school was built between 1965 and 1967. Um, there may have been some renovations that happened afterwards, but I think um, the reason that they're in the process of trying to, to renovate the school now is because it hasn't been renovated in a very long time. Okay. Senator but, Lyons, so, you all set? Yeah, uh, yeah, more or less. I mean, there's so many questions in this thing. And um, if we're going to go, if we're going to start we are very concerned. And as we start testing schools, regardless of when they were built, um, it, it, I think it's very important to understand if any of these products were distributed after the EPA ban on PCBs. I mean, because then that, and then if that is the case, um, how can we hold the schools harmless or the state harmless for the significant costs of um, 
testing and repair. So that, that's a comment, but it's I, th I think it's a great concern. I do have one little tiny question, and that is, as you're doing testing, are you doing any on-site testing? Are you, do you have that capacity to bring in the, your, um, I don't know what you're using, a mass spectrometer or what? Um, for indoor air sampling, potentially, I know if you're doing the building material sampling, we had looked into that um, with use of the EPA mobile lab. and. And it doesn't work as well only because if you're, what I understand anyway, when you're looking at a caulking, the PCBs are so um, entrenched within the material that you really need oh. to make sure that you're grinding it up really well so that you can get the, the um, PCB concentrations out the best through extraction. So there's a potential that it could happen with indoor air, but probably not with the building materials. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, Thank you. And before going on to Senators Campion, Westman, and Hardy, just a quick follow-up then based on what Senator Lyons just asked. If, if those PCB-containing materials may have been imported after the ban, does that 1980 date need to be moved closer in time? We went back and forth on that because I'm sure there's the potential that there were, you know, products of mastic or caulking that were ordered in bulk and now they're being used. Um, so we could look later in like 1985 potentially and, and go back from there. So we did contemplate looking at a, um, a wider age range because of that thought process. Okay, thanks. Uh, Senator Campion. Uh, thanks, Senator Bright. <clears throat> uh, I'm wondering what it means to be non-detect it, sound, it seems as though non-detect, there, there's some PCB there, there's something. Um, is it just that's the safety level? I know we've, we dealt with this a little bit when we were doing the lead bill as well. So non-detect, um, you would basically look at what the detection limit is that the lab is reporting to you at. And let's say it's four nanograms per cubic meter, non-detect would be below what their detection limit is. But there's um, still, but there's still PCB there. Not that the instrument is reporting to so you. So non-detect means zero. Non-detect means it's not being detected by the instrument. Great, perfect, thank you. <laughs> Senator Westman, um, I'm interested in, um, you know, at at the top level, it's twenty thousand per school, and um, apparently you said that the ed um, agency is trying to refine the number of schools that would need to be tested um, that are um, before 1980. When will we have that information? I'm not sure when the agency of education- Just, provided... if I might, uh, <laughs> for the record, Peter Watt, Commissioner of DC. Senator Westman, that's a great question. I think what we're finding across the board, and that's part of the reason why I believe that there's a broader effort to look into the condition of, of various school buildings around the state, is that we don't have great records at the state level and we're working to improve those, but it is gonna require a you know, district by district survey to understand the, the full universe. This estimate was based on what we know and what we imagine um, is, is likely, but it will need to be significantly refined. Well, the, I just say the four and a half million is pretty much hitting between 15 and 20,000 per school because there's 250 schools in the state. It would seem that if we were going to move ahead with this, we should f um, very quickly be able to find out with that confined number what the real number of schools would need to be done. I can pretty much tell you that of the 10 elementary schools in my district, three were built after 1980 and, uh, or two were built after 1980 and one has been completely the school gutted and rebuilt. So, but I would think we would want, we want to be pretty diligent to try to get those numbers to be able to move ahead with this. Um, and to be so, fair, certainly we, we agree with that and we want to get there 
the question of, of timing and where we are in the legislative calendar, right? We wanted to get this in as part of the budget. We understand there was significant interest. Um, and so wanted to make sure that, that that process was started. And certainly there are other steps that we'll need to complete along the way. I, I, I would say it, we put the money in for Burlington in um, the budget adjustment, but um, this, is, this is really pretty important stuff. And, you know, so a lot of us that have districts where um, we know our schools were built, um, um, you know, before I haven't got a single high school in my district that was um, um, built after 1980. Um, so, um, you know, having that information would be really important. Um, so, uh... Commissioner Walk, uh, I don't know if that is something on your to-do list or this goes back to Ms. Capolino, um, but who could we check in with to get a, you know, basically something like a date certain to know what we're talking about so that we can then go ahead and do planning and budgeting? So are who we, kind of I mean, owns, who, so who owns this that we can ask about it? Right, so it's a it's a it's a combined effort between the agency of education, the agency of net resources, and the Department of Health. I think we all have a role to play here. Um, I think one of the open questions, and frankly, you hit on it in your earlier questioning, was whether or not schools would be required to test. Because I think, as Trish made clear, we currently don't regulate indoor air quality in in as as a result of of releases. It doesn't constitute a release under our current statute. So if we're going to, we, we built this with in part with the idea that it could be used as a volunteer testing program by schools or as a mandatory, but that question is frankly open and one we don't have uh, control over and one we would be looking to work with you on to understand what the desire of the General Assembly is. Okay, uh, thank you. So that seems like one to flag as a policy question to make sure we come back to. Um, all right, any, uh, Senator Hardy, thank you for waiting. Thank you, Senator Bray. Um, I have two clarifying questions and then a broader comment, but um, Patricia, um, could you just clarify for me, is the EPA uh, level, is that the 15 nanograms per cubic meter or is that the Vermont VDH level? The um, Vermont VDH level is the 15 nanograms per cubic meter. Okay, and then the the EPA levels are those higher levels, the 100, 200, 300, whatever in that chart. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, um, and so that was my first clarify. The second is, is there a requirement at this point in law or rule or wherever that requires um, entities, schools, or other public entities to report if they've detected any PCBs? Because I know this was an issue in Burlington that these were discovered and it took, I believe, almost a year for them to be reported to teachers and parents, et cetera. So is there a requirement or is it just voluntary? So there's a requirement if PCBs are detected in groundwater, soil, sediment, or surface water in Vermont um, to be reported to the Agency of Natural Resources as a release. Um, when PCBs are detected in building materials, the requirement for TOSCA is to report it when they're ready to clean it up. Aha, uh -huh. so that was probably contributed to the delay that there was, they weren't ready to clean it up yet and it wasn't it wasn't necessarily in the water and soil. It was in the soil. Um, oh, okay. and it was in the soil from the building materials contaminating the soil. So that should have been reported to the Agency of Natural Resources at that time as a release. Okay, I see. Um, and just sort of broader and Commissioner Walk kind of um, alluded to this, but um, you know, this feels a little bit like deja vu. Um, I was on the Senate Education Committee two years ago when we went through this whole process with the water led water testing that Senator Campion mentioned. And it seems to me that 
we're going to every two years have some other issue um, or other toxic chemical that's found in schools or somewhere. And I'm wondering if um, it may be prudent um, or not wondering, I think it would be prudent to sort of set up this kind of system more broadly. If you're doing a survey already or planning one, um, maybe we should include other things in that survey. Um, and um, I think the, the sort of system that was, was created by Department of Health and DEC for the lead testing, um, as far as I know, worked quite well. And I was very impressed with the public database that you set up and everything. So I, I'm just wondering if we could, if there are other things on our radar, I know radon is one issue and there are other toxic chemicals um, that may be helpful to include in this. Um, but doing so without losing sight of PC of the urgency of the PCBs, but um, it, it may be more efficient to tackle it. And I'm wondering if maybe commissioner, if you were going to address something like that in your comments, or if you have any thoughts about that. Trish, I'm happy to weigh in. I, I, so I, I think you have uh, identified a, a key issue. I will say that I, I don't believe that, you know, it's easy to see the sort of the, the, the lead and, and PCB issues as, as similar and there are lots of similarities, right? Things we don't want to be in schools uh, as a basic starting point. Um, the challenge is that the, 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 what we would do in, when we found a lead in drinking water in schools was primarily a sort of uh, replacement of the faucet or drinking water fountain or whatever it might be, which was relatively small scale and, and inexpensive. This really is a, would require sort of building wide survey of materials, significant investigation. The cleanup is, is significantly more expensive. Um, and so it, it's a little bit different to have them on the same sort of timelines and, and thought processes. And they're, they're, as we think about what other things we might be looking for, um, there is there, that sort of raises it raises further challenges as to sort of would the would the identification of an issue and the potential remediation of that issue be on similar timelines and how we would resolve some of those things. But I do appreciate, and that's one of the things certainly that um, that the agency of education is thinking about in terms of their survey is to understand sort of the full gamut of need and. So there is, but that, but that is on a, um, on a, on a more deliberate and diligent timeline as, as uh, Senator Westman referred to in, in trying to understand that sort of full context, but understanding the full context does make it move slower. Okay. I just don't want to waste a good survey. You know, if you're going to survey schools, they get a lot of surveys. You might as well survey them about multiple things at the same time. Right. Um, I, I, have data. Let me clarify quickly, just so there's, there's not confusion. So the survey we would do would be a quick sort of tell us about the age of your building so we understand the universe of the, of the testing need. The survey that AOE has in place is, think, is contemplating and I believe is, is part of the budget discussion. I'm a little unclear about that, but I can, we can get the details for you. Would be more of a uh, hiring somebody to do a, a more detailed analysis of the state of, of Vermont school buildings um, across, you know, across the board. And so that's a much different level of effort that, than, than would be required for us to, to kind of do that first screening level examination of what buildings might need to be tested. Right. Well, and to Senator Hardy's point, and I'm sure Senator Lyons, whose hand is up, will have something more she can share with us too. I mean, the, the, on our agenda, this is listed as PCBs and other chemicals of concern because we know that we don't wanna be in the whack-a-mole business of coming back one by one by one. And that's always seems like it's one of our challenges with toxins that over time we identify more of them and or we come, become more sensitive to the, the impacts of things that we once thought were healthy. Now we see as maybe riskier than we believe because science advances. So it seems like there, another follow-on discussion would be how do we have a more comprehensive survey plan, regardless of the timeline for the different chemicals, because they're not all the same. And the, I think, and the fixes aren't all the same. I would hate to have anyone listen to us have, uh, talking about this and come away 
and I know you don't mean this, uh, that we don't want to look for things that would be very expensive to remediate. So we'll have to figure out a way around, you know, how to address that. Senator Lyons and then Senator Westman and then Senator Campion. Well, thank you. Um, as, as the discussion goes on, of course, it reminds us that the Vermont Department of Health and through our Health and Welfare Committee, we've put in place a comprehensive children's products um, assessment of toxic chemicals and, and trying to eliminate those toxic chemicals from children's products. The original intent of that program was to have a full expanse of consumer products generally. And that didn't, that hasn't happened, but it is absolutely essential. I think as Senator Bray has said that we have that comprehensive analysis or, or actually elimination of those chemicals that are so toxic, particularly to public health. So that's a broader conversation right now we're nickel and diming schools <laughs> and and then we're making a decision that maybe we shouldn't be testing some chemicals in schools because it's so expensive and we should i mean there's no question that we should be working as as quickly as possible to um to change over the school environment for kids so it will be costly, but, but I do think that this all falls into the purview, in this case, um, as did lead, it falls into the purview of the Department of Health and we need to, to work on that. I know that ANR also has the hazardous chemicals group that's looking at hazardous chemicals. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned that we not, that we let some of the schools go for one reason or another. Um, we need to have that list and we need to know what contamination is there uh, regardless of cost because the cost to our children and to healthcare in the future is astronomical. Uh, just, just looking at PCBs, uh, looking at BPAs, BPA um, and related compounds, the cost in Maine was over $637 million a year uh, for healthcare effects for kids. So, um, you, you, so you hear my plea. I, I think working together to test, get the information, Senator Hardy's interest in, in uh, transparency for the public is, is also critical. But I think first we have to know what's there. So uh, Sarah Lyons, if I might just clarify, I, just, I don't want to leave the impression with the committee at all that we are not looking to test. That's, we wouldn't have put forward this proposal no. if we weren't looking to test. No. We just, I didn't, I did not, uh, Commissioner, I did not get that impression. Uh, and, and you've always been very proactive in this area. So um, thank you. Right. Yeah. And the same here. I'm just saying there will be some people who will be concerned about the liability of what could be revealed by testing. And I think, you know, my sense of this room is that everyone wants to go ahead with the testing, regardless of what kind of financial implications that testing might reveal to all of us. Um, Senator Westman. I just uh, like to say, I totally agree that we should do something comprehensive. This problem is in front of us. Many of us have lots of schools that, um, were built before 1980 and the legislature um, more than likely will not um, will be on more of a normal schedule this year than we've been. So we have real uh, will be gone after <coughs> May. And um, so from my vantage point, there's some urgency to figure out what schools might be at risk where we are to be able to make sure we can deal with that because I wouldn't want to be in the position of waiting for another year. Sure. Well, thank you for that. Um, Ms. Capolino, you just took down your, your PowerPoint and I was going to ask you about the your second budgeting Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Senator Bray, may I just get in the yes. queue also, please? 
Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, this might be for the commissioner. Uh, do we know, for example, I know with your work with PFOA, you know, we've had these conversations over the years where, you know, we can outlaw certain things in the United States and in the state of Vermont, but then they still might come in, you know, from other countries. And I'm just wondering, do we know, and this might be a kind of a silly question, but are, are people manufacturing in other countries with PCBs? And is it possible that, that we are, you know, receiving in this country things with PCBs that, you know, as we continue to build, et cetera. Do we have any sense of that? <clears throat> that is not a question I can answer at this point. Um, but yeah, I agree with you that there are there are challenges to the way we regulate chemicals at the federal level under TSCA. Some of the changes that were part of the Lautenberg amendments in 2016 helped improve that system, but it is yeah, there are challenges. So let, let us dig into that a little bit more unless Trish has, has some knowledge off the top of her head, um, but that's a lot to- No, I really appreciate uh, that. And I'm wondering also, and this could be kind of, I mean, is our PCBs, just so I know, are they being used anywhere now in the United States or is it just, they're done? I mean, there's no, they're, they're just, they're not in, if I buy, you know, when I go out later to buy a beam for something, which I usually do on a Tuesday afternoon, uh, is there, it's definitely, there's, there's nothing, there's no reason to be concerned that a PCB might've been manufactured and put into something in this country. So there's still PCBs that are used in capacitors and transformers and um, okay. other um, industrial products that are not um, required to remove the PCBs right now. So the EPA is still allowing for that use. So there are, if, there are school, some, if a school were to buy something, and would they know that it has a PCBs in it, you know, going forward? So in the U.S., they're banned. Um, okay. I'm not aware that they're being manufactured in other parts of the world right now. I haven't seen that. I did did look for that earlier. Um, maybe even Dr. Rose might know more, but I'm not seeing that they're still being manufactured. Okay, uh, Senator Lyons. No, oh, that's what I was going to say. I'm 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 good. Okay, so what, before we um, go on, or uh, can I just confirm that the four and a half million uh, ballpark estimate for testing uh, for PCB statewide is that in the current governor's recommend? Yes. yes. Okay. It's it's and more of the one-time the um, surplus spending recommendations. Um, it is okay included in the in the as part of a ten million dollar transfer to the environmental contingency fund, and up to five million of that is is set aside for testing and technical support, and the public uh, awareness website or work that that Senator Hardy referenced. Regarding okay. That. And. And Ms. Capolino's second budgetary slide with all the remediation, et cetera, that's where we don't have uh, monies allocated yet because those are gonna be on a case by case basis. Correct. Mr. Chair? Y yes. I just wanted to get that part straight yeah. and then Senator McDonald. Just okay, what, Senator McDonald. We, we hear occasionally the phrase uh, one time spending surplus money, et cetera. Um, what exactly does that mean? Are you, is that a question for me or? Uh, I, no, that was, uh, um, Ms. Mr. Walk um, used that and it's, we, we, in budgetary matters, we, matters, we, we hear more frequently the expression one-time money um, surplus something or other, that's where the money is coming from. What is, could, could we get a more specific understanding of, of what that term means? Sorry, my internet uh, connectivity got a little unstable there. Um, as I was trying to explain it, I think I cut out. It, it is essentially a transfer from the general fund to the environmental contingency fund that is not part of our base budget, is not an ongoing expense. It is a transfer, a, a one-time transfer recommended in the budget that would transfer general fund dollars into the environmental contingency fund. 
And then from there, $5 million, up to $5 million would be made available for this testing proposal. So when the general fund is being, when the budget is being crafted for state um, spending, it, it will be short that amount of money this year. And is there any, where is it gonna come from? Just from the routine revenues to the general fund? Correct, and and in the belief from the both the legislative and the uh, executive economists that the the there was an increase in revenue in this or it projected for the coming year that we're not likely to see on an ongoing basis. It comes from from that portion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the finance committee will probably be looking at the the kind of roller coaster um, projections about revenues that have been taking place over the last nine months where they're up and they're down and they're up and they're down. So thank you very much. And thanks for the clarification. Can I um, quickly ask Senator McCormick a question uh, that has, has this been taken up in the institutions committee at all as a capital expenditure? You're muted, Senator. Uh, good reason to learn sign language. Yeah. It's, an up or no it's a yes or no question there. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Has it been taken up in institutions as possible capital expenditure for any of the remediation? Oh, okay. It might, that, that might be a good conversation. Well, you know, part of the interesting thing about this meeting is that we have um, our committee is usually focusing on what's outside of a building. You know, the ter our territory sort of tends to come up to the, the building's edge. And then, uh, you know, health and welfare, I don't know how you would describe it. It's more like you're looking at products and things people have in their hands. And uh, I don't know who sort of owns the indoor space of a school. Maybe that's education worrying about what's going on inside there, but it, it's of interest to all of us. And we, uh, so it's good that we're all in the same meeting at the same time, because we don't want it to fall through the cracks just by virtue of not quite being clearly someone's jurisdiction. Um, uh, I will say, um, Senator, that yeah. anything that affects the human condition in terms of the indoor environment is clearly uh, health and welfare. And, but okay. however, in this instance, it certainly is a part of the educational enterprise for expenditures and remediation. And it carries outside to the, uh, to the soil as you heard soil testing. So right. it affects each one of our committees. Right. So. We say if it's on planet Earth, Earth our committee's interested. <laughs> That's good. We like that. Um, okay. So, uh, Ms. Vos and Mr. Englander, you've been with us. Uh, Ms. Well, let me pause and say, Ms. Capolino, did you have anything more you wanted to share with us this morning? I know you've already, thank you very much for that helpful order, orderly presentation on, on the whole issue. Um, I don't have anything and, else right now. Okay. And so I don't know if um, Ms. Vos or Mr. Englander, if you had anything you wanted that you had planned to share with us on this topic, or you were just here for technical support, you know. Yeah, um, so my name is Sarah Vos, I'm the state toxicologist and I assess the health risk from exposure to chemicals in our environment. Um, so Trish did uh, include an explanation of health effects from PCBs. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about that. Well, I, I do have one quick one, and that is as part of our work on plastics last summer, or summer before last, we learned about um, PCBs as, <laughs> we're getting a sign held up here. I am un muting it is not responding okay we're not holding you responsible for bad for an equipment failure thank you senator mccormick um 
the uh, at any rate, we so we were looking uh, at that moment at PFAS, and then we had testimony from um, I'm forgetting his name, a PhD from down at uh, Johns Hopkins who was talking to us about um, PFAS and other plastics uh, as endocrine disruptors. And then the, it was orders of magnitude, like two orders of magnitude more sensitive uh, in terms of possible impacts. So can you just say a little bit about, you know, we might feel like our 15 nanograms per cubic meter is a, a reasonable standard, but do you have the sense that uh, we will learn that these are actually impactful at even lower concentrations and that we'll need to adjust them in the future? I mean, where is this a, the, the levels will keep dropping as we come, as our, as our understanding becomes more and more subtle. Yeah, so PCBs, and I think Trish might have mentioned this, PCBs are a class of 209 different chemicals that we, that we call PCBs, and some of them are very potent endocrine disruptors. Uh, we also know that they are potent developmental toxicants, so they affect the way that a developing baby's brain is formed, and those can have impacts in, to children later in life. And we know that these PCBs <clears throat> last a very long time in the environment. So that's, you know, similar to PFAS. They don't break down very easily. They also don't leave our bodies very quickly. So the half-lives of PCBs, you know, they do range because there are 209, but some of them are, are decades. Um, so, you know, we, we do have a lot of concern about those um, when you're dealing with developmental toxicants, especially something that can stay in your body for a very long time. It means that even short exposures to, for example, young women um, could lead to exposure to their baby later on in life. Um, as far as the, the levels, you know, Trish explained a little bit about detection level and reporting level. Um, the screening value that we created was selected to be um, above the detection level because, you know, it, it's uh, not very feasible to have a screening level that's below what the machines can detect. Um, so your question of whether or not it would go lower, I think, would be a function of how quickly the analytical methods, so one, if they change and how quickly they change to be able to go down orders of magnitude. Um, but I mean, nanograms per meter cubed is already a, a very low, you're, we're in the very low um, range there. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Lyons? So thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Voss. Uh, the, the question I have is, do we have any indication of, is there a trend line in a state or any indication of uh, increased effects or effects of as a result of PCB exposure in kids, you know, the, um, obviously developmental delays or autism or some what some of the some of the effects may be there. But have we done any measurement, public health measurement, on those illnesses or changes that would suggest PCBs have had an effect? There are publications that look at neurodevelopmental impacts from PCBs. There are not I'm any. Not, I guess I'm talking about Vermont more. Th I'm not talking about yeah. sort of the general literature, but yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, so I was just going to say there are not any that specifically look at exposure in schools for some of the reasons that Trish has explained. And there are not any that look at exposure outcomes in Vermont. Any other questions for our guests from the Department of Health this morning? All right. Um, well, thanks. Uh, I'm gonna, I, since I haven't seen you in a meeting since the last session, uh, I'll just say along, uh, sort of this is one of those on behalf of every Vermonter, thank you so much for all the, your work uh, during the pandemic. I know it's been it's, it, it's something we say, and it does, it sounds like it gets repeated. It's hard for us to appreciate how much work it's been for you all. And, uh, but uh, we appreciate it and know that 
part of the reason that Vermont is doing so exceptionally well in the country is uh, because of the work of you and your colleagues. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. I'll pass it along. I work with a very broad group of people, but I'll pass it along to everyone. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. So that finishes a first conversation as a group um, on PCVs and school testing. Um, thankfully, there's money in the budget, at least to address this particular toxin. But um, yeah, the bigger question that I think we'll want to work on as a group is, uh, how do we move away from re being reactive to the discovery of one thing to getting out ahead of a, a wider panel of tests? Um, and I think, so we've done it with, we've done a version of it with lead. We've done a version of it with PFAS. Now we're talking about revisiting on PCBs. Um, radon, when I was on the education committee had come up as another problem and, um, so uh, I'm just sensing that we're, it's a little bit like Groundhog Day where we're having a, another version of the same conversation repeatedly. Um, I don't know how we, what plans we, sh I guess we should continue the conversation about how do we move from reactive to um, looking at things that aren't already listed as a, a known problem, but may well be there. Uh, Senator Lyons. So thank you for the comments. I couldn't agree with you. Um, I couldn't agree with you more in particular with respect to the good work that the Department of Health is doing uh, during this difficult time. Um, I, I, my, the reason I raised my hand is that Senate Health and Welfare needs to move back into its own room at this point yeah. and um, thank you uh, right. for the joint we meeting. Wanna, we didn't wanna say anything, but it was getting a little crowded in here. Yeah, so. I can tell, you know, we want a good air quality. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Maybe, um, and, thanks and for joining I, us. I have a, actually I have a question for, for uh, Commissioner Walk and for um, uh, Dr. Voss. Um, and that is, have we tested the state house for this, a uh, bad question. <laughs> I'm I am not aware of any tests at the state house. Okay. Uh, for PCBs, <laughs> um, obviously we are talking to talking about a subset of buildings at this point, but um, obviously that wasn't limited to the use of of PCB containing building yeah. materials in schools. Okay. Thank you. And committee, Senator, as soon as Senator, Senator Hooker finishes before you go, your Senator Hooker question, we need to leave. Yeah, just a, just a quick question to Dr. Voss. Uh, are there any um, anticipated um, studies for, you know, looking into the prevalence of um, effects of the PCVs? Um, so, so maybe I'll, I'll, I can just explain quickly. Um, so EPA's levels are based on the state of the science as of 1994. And when we looked at the same science, we also looked at newer science, you know, 1994 was quite a while ago. Um, and that's one of the reasons why our levels are so much lower. Um, so whether or not EPA will go back and take another look at the additional decades of research that um, show health effects, including developmental neurotoxicity at lower doses than what they found in 1994. I would, I think it's anybody's guess as to where, if and when they would ever reopen that and come up with a lower level. But with, with regard to what's happened at Burlington High School, will Vermont move forward in, and look at the effects that PCDs have had? I mean, we said that there's no data and I'm just questioning, you know, how do we go forward when we have no data to rely on as far as what the effects have been? Okay, yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. Um, so I think you're asking if we would do an epidemiology study and my, um, typically when we're asked that question, um, you know, those studies are typically done in academic institutions that are that are research, um, you, 
entities and we're not a research entity. Um, the, typically, the number of people you would need to enroll and the amount of time you would have to conduct the study would be very prohibitive. Um, in, in Vermont, we have such a low population, um, but there are a number of studies and granted they weren't done specifically in Vermont, but there are those epidemiology studies done on larger populations that do show these outcomes pretty consistently and clearly in different populations. Thank you. Sorry to hold up our committee. All right, well, <clears throat> good to see the members of Health and Welfare. Thanks for joining us. See you again. And thank you, uh, uh, Department of Health. Okay, thank you.